Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Thank you very much for coming. I hope the first part of the day has been a blessing for you in your classes, in your fellowship, in all that you've done. Is there anyone with us who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? Anyone? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. Raise your hand. Who is with us for the first time today? All right. Okay. You were for the first two sessions. That's fine. Nice to have you. What countries do we have? Philippines? Philippines? All right. Uh, Angola? Malawi? Uh, U.S.? All right. What did I miss? India? Okay. Uh, what country did I miss? Congo. Congo. Okay. Brazil? All right. UK. UK. United Kingdom, what city? Birmingham. Uh, Birmingham. Manchester. 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 I've spoken in both cities. Okay. Manchester United is worshipped all over the world. Okay. <laughs> Any other country? <laughs> Malaysia. Who's from Malaysia? I've been to Malaysia five times. Love Malaysia. I uh, love Malaysia. Any other country? Yes. Liberia. I thought I said Liberia. They may say Malawi. All right. Any other country? Togo. Togo. Togo, little West African country. Togo, next to Ghana. Oh, that's right. Okay, all right. Uh, any other country? Anyone from heaven? <laughs> None of you from heaven? Okay, all right. Yes, my good brother. Sudan. Sudan. Now there are two Sudans. This is South Sudan and Sudan. Sudan. You have the northern section there. Okay, capital of Khartoum, or very historical city. Khartoum. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray after you've turned off your phones. I'll give you 30 seconds. Do you know research is beginning to show people are developing addictions to these things? Cannot turn them off. They're on them while they're sleeping. They just cannot, there should be nothing in this world that controls you except the Spirit of God. Not a phone. Do you know there are people who die because they're attached to these phones? They are texting and they are walking and walk right into a bus. No, this is true. They're texting, road repairs are being done, there's a large hole, and this woman is walking, walks right into the hole cannot lift their heads from these things. And I know they're not texting Jesus. Are they off? Well, somebody answer me. Yes. All right. Is it not your culture to answer the preacher? <laughs> is, it, is, it, is that a problem? Yes. Oh, I didn't know. Can you change it today? <laughs> All right. Think of courtesy. Someone asks you a question, you answer, especially a guest thousands of miles from home. I want to go back home and tell my wife, everyone at AUP is courteous and pleasant and kind. Is that the truth, yes or no? Yes. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> In Matthew 25, reading from verse 14, the Bible says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Verse 15, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. Verse 17, then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made him other five talents. Likewise, he that had received the two, he also gave other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. All right. We leave that right there. Let's go to Genesis 1, reading from verse 14. And God said, Let us make lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made what? 
to what? What kind of light? Great light. Read the Bible very carefully. And God made two great lights. They were both great. But listen to what the verse goes on to say. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. They were both great, but one was greater and one was lesser. Which means that God himself introduced into the creation the concept of one thing being greater than another. There's no equality. Are you not listening? It's too early to turn me off. God's creation gives us the information that God deliberately makes some things greater than others. But both are perfect. Go to Genesis 3. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now there were hundreds of beasts of the field. The Bible says God made the serpent more subtle than any other animal. He deliberately gave the serpent more intelligence than he gave to maybe a cow. Very stupid animal. <laughs> this is God. Let me say it again. God is fair, not equal. In mind, character, and personality, I think it's volume 1, page 626, paragraph 2, Ellen White writes, it was never God's plan that all people should share equally in the resources of the earth. Even before sin, God's arrangement was some would be greater than others. When God made Adam, he made him first. It is one of the indications Adam was the head. He had more power than Eve. But both were perfect. Before sin, the father was always higher than the son. But both are fully God. The father and the son have more authority than the Holy Ghost. But all three are fully God. Understand me clearly. God is fair, not equal. Now, let's go back to the first passage we read. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods, the man is Christ, the servants of the church. And to one, he gave five talents. To another, two. To another, one. Was that unfair of God? Now you must answer some questions immediately. Was that unfair of God? No. He decided you'll have five, you'll have two, you'll have one, and this man will have a quarter. He decided that, but his expectations were the same. Make the most of what you have. Moses goes on to say verse 16, Then he that had received the five went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. He uses five to the maximum he came up with ten. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. He used them to the maximum, his result, four. The guy with five, his maximum, the result is ten. But two maximums are the same. You didn't get it. You said it didn't because you're nice, but you didn't get it. <laughs> Let me show you what I mean. Huh? Here's a bottle. Are you with me? Yes. Now, I saw some plastic cups around somewhere. If you took one of those plastic cups, you have one? Let me see your plastic cup. Oh, you don't have one. You have a plastic uh, Oh, okay. Which is bigger? Oh, mine is bigger. Okay, all right. Mine is slightly bigger than his. Now, let's reverse it. His is bigger than mine. Okay. If I fill this to the brim, and I fill this to the brim, 
in volume, they are different. But both are full. One isn't fuller than the other. Are you sure you're following me? Yes. If a thimble of water is full and a bathtub is full, both are full. Even though with respect to volume, one has more than the other. God's concern is not if you have more than John. God's concern is, have you used what you have so that your container is full? That is why you must not compare yourselves with somebody else. It is an insult to God who specializes in uniqueness. Do you realize no two leaves are precisely the same? I come from a state in the United States where it snows very heavily. No two snowflakes have ever been discovered to be the same, even though every snowflake is six-sided. Each one has a different pattern. Two identical twins are not precisely identical. No one has the same fingerprint uh, markings. No two leaves are the same. God is not a specialist in replication. He's a specialist in uniqueness. Now, he gave you whatever you have. And he gave the other person whatever he or she has. Now God is saying to you, with your five, bring me ten. With your two, bring me four. With your one, bring me two. God does not want the person with one to bring four, and the person with two to bring ten. If that's clear, say amen. amen. You have to ask yourself, what has God given me, and your mission in life is to use it in such a way that the one God has given you multiplies into two. Then God gives you what grade? A for Adventists. Can you say amen? amen. Uh, you must decide God gave me two talents. When he comes for a reckoning, I want to give him four. God gives you A. He comes to the man with five or the lady. I want ten. You give God ten, he gives you what? A. All the grades are the same, but the talents were different. But the use of the talents was the same. That's why the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that do not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. God is fair, he is not equal. All right, having said that, you believe God gave you two talents of intellect, fine. You come to AUP to use them for God's glory. You may have to work harder than the person who has five. The person with five may get the concepts of physics like that. He goes to bed at night with a physics book under his pillow and everything goes into his head. <laughs> you are sweating in the library every day to learn to memorize for every action there's an equal and opposite react. It took you six weeks to remember that. But the man with five, he looked at it and it stuck. God doesn't judge you by him, he judges you by you. But for both the one with five and the one with two and the one with one, God is ready to provide divine help. Because the one with five is not God. Are you with me? Only God knows everything. everything, which means everyone who is not God needs help. Yes. Are you listening to me? Yes. Everyone who is not God needs help. From the weakest sinner, that's me, to the angel Gabriel, the highest created being. Now, let me give an example of God blessing someone's mind who tried. Go to Daniel 8. Daniel 8. Have you found it? It's in the Old Testament. 
You know, these days you have to tell Adventists that. <laughs> Daniel's in the Old Testament. Genesis is in the Old Testament because they're looking somewhere between Corinthians and Galatians. <laughs> so you have to tell them because we depend on phones so much. We no longer need to memorize. Who can recite all 66 books? Come. <laughs> Come. Then we go to Daniel E. What's your name? JR. JR. Come, JR. All right, all 66. Genesis and Revelation. Go ahead. Okay, I know it by song, but since I. Uh, okay, I'll try by words. Uh -huh. We have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 King, 2 King, 1 Chronicle, and 2 Chronicles. And then we have Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and then we have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, <laughs> then Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, then Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. New Testament. We have in New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Let the church say amen. 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 Thank you, Dr. J.R. <laughs> God bless you. God bless you. All right. What book did I say? Amen. What chapter? Eight. In verse 13, there are two heavenly beings speaking. And I heard one certain say, it, say it to the saint who spoke, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of the desolation to cause the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Verse 14, which is the key verse for the Adventist church. And he said, What? Unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Amen. Now, in great controversy, page 409, paragraph 1, Ella White writes, the scripture which above all other had been both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent movement was the declaration unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Amen. That is the foundation biblical stone of this church. That's why this church is different from every other church. Nobody said amen. 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 I'm talking to Pentecostals. <laughs> this church is different from every other church. It is built on Daniel 8.14 and Revelation chapter 10. All right. Verse 15. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then they stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, finish the verse. Make this man to understand the vision. Look at 15 again. Read it for me. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had done two things. What's the first one? Seeing the vision stop. Well, I stop. He saw the vision. You sit in the class. You see the lecture. You go to the lab. You see the gross anatomy. You're trying to figure out the hip joint and the muscle insertion and origin and function and innervation. You see it. Hmm? Now, what's the second thing Daniel did? Sorry. He sought for the meaning. What does that tell you? He studied it someone else. He sought for the meaning. What is science? The search for truth answers to clearly structured questions. If your question isn't clear, you can't find the answer. Science is a search for answers. The Bible says, when he had seen the vision and sought, he tried to do what? Understand. No, that's the human part. When he tried, to his living and could not understand verse 19 and I verse 16 and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli which cried and said what Gabriel 
make this man to understand the vision. God saw Daniel try. He understand the other parts of the vision. He understood the head of gold was a, uh, or the, 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 not the head of gold in chapter eight, the, 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 the ram was Medo-Persian. He understood the goat with the notable horn was a Medo-Persian. He understood that. He could not understand until 2,300 days. He tried. But when human effort has reached its limit, what happens? Heaven steps in. And so God said to Gabriel, why do I say God? Who is the highest created being in heaven? Gabriel, not God. God is not created. Who said God? Repent. God is not created. You can't make that mistake. Come on, tell God you're sorry. God is not created. I said, who is the highest created being? What's the answer? Gabriel. Now, who then can give Gabriel orders? God. I heard a man's voice to the banks of Uli, which cried and said, Gabriel, finish the verse. Make this man, go on, understand what he can't understand. Listen to the wording. Make him understand. What do you call that? Give me one word. One word, not explain. Good word, but not what I want. Listen to the voice talking to Gabriel. Make this man understand. What is that? A command. Now, do angels obey God's commands? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Daniel had a guarantee of comprehension because a divine being, a holy being, was commanded to make him understand. Which means if Daniel had not understood, Gabriel would have failed, would have disobeyed. Ah, you're not listening. <laughs> you're sleeping with your eyes open. <laughs> Listen again. If Daniel had not understood, Gabriel would have failed or disobeyed. The command was make him understand. Gabriel had no choice. Go to verse 9, reading from verse 21. Yea, whilst I was yet speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caught, caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Verse 22 of Daniel 9. And he informed me and talked with me and said what? Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to do what? Give thee skill and understanding. Let me ask you this. Did God give Daniel and the three Hebrew boys knowledge and wisdom? Did he do that? Yes. yes. We have to know they studied. God does not honor laziness. There will be no lazy people in heaven. By the way, a lazy person can't take the Sabbath. What did I say? A lazy person cannot keep the Sabbath. Not working on Saturday is not keeping the Sabbath. If that were the case, every unemployed Filipino would be a Sabbath keeper. Are you with me? Daniel, I am now come to give you skill and understanding. What am I saying to you? When you have tried your best, hmm, what does that involve? You make time for studies. You sacrifice some social time. You cut out girlfriend and boyfriend time. You cut out basketball time because an area of study needs additional time. You increase your prayer life. You give a little more time to Bible study that a divine book may sharpen your mind for a secular book. Ah, you turned me off again. <laughs> Here's what young people do. They put away the Bible to make time for physics. Mistake. You are putting away the inventor of physics. Amen. Amen. Don't do that. Now, so when you've tried, you've made some time, you've formed a small study group with some of your colleagues who understand it better than you. You've read the material from another textbook. You've met with your professor. Hmm? You've prayed. You stop eating meat. You change your diet. You're trying to understand. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> then you go to God. You 
say, Father, I have done what? My best. God says, I see that. I can see the perspiration on your brow. I know you did your best. Gabriel, make this man understand physics. Come on, say amen. Gabriel, make that woman understand English grammar. Hmm? Divinity stands ready to assist humanity. Amen. But you see, when God made us, he made us dependent. He did not make us helpless. Because a helpless person can't sin against God. A helpless person can't rebel. Are you following me? No, you're not. But I'll still stick with you. He made us dependent. So now do all you can with the power I have given you. When you've exhausted your limits, then I will step in and honor your effort by blessing you with revelation. Amen. Amen. My question to you is, can God say of you what he said of Daniel? Even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Do you seek to understand your biology? Or are you glad to get away from the class like someone escaping from prison? <laughs> are, you, are you glad to spend more time with your pharmacology and your gross anatomy and your physiology trying to understand? I told one group, you do not have to be a genius in order to succeed in school. You just have to be disciplined. You have to work hard in an organized way in a particular direction. You know, you can get into a swimming pool and tread water. And where do you go? Nowhere. You stay one place, but are you using energy? Yes. Your feet are going up and down so you don't sink. You're staying in one place, but you're busy. Now someone changes the direction of the energy and moves. Are you following me? We need to stop treading water. When I was at Oakwood, there was a young man. He was in school since creation. <laughs> Every semester, he has one more semester. We used to call him One More Quarter. That's his nickname. I mean, for years, One More Quarter. Never finished. Never applied himself, what you call a professional student. Now, there's a good way to be a professional student. You're always learning in the school of Christ. That's, that's good. Not, you can never graduate from a school. And so my young friends, you have to individualize yourself. God made me who I am. God gave me the gifts I have. Now, if we go back to five talents, two talents, and one, Remember now that your talents could increase with what? U S E. What's that? Use. Which means God has a principle in the universe that affects created beings. As you use your five, after a while you realize you have six. As you use the six, you realize you have what? seven, then eight, then nine, then ten, and who knows how far that will go in the next world. Are you using your five? Who's lazy? You're lazy? God bless you for being honest, not for being lazy, for being honest. Your laziness is a sin. I know you're a handsome man, but your sin is, your ugliness is ugly. Your laziness is ugly. You say, God, I'm sorry. Jesus was, let me tell you what Ellen White says about Jesus. Desire of Ages, page 72, paragraph 4. Christ was as careful as a workman as he was in character. Ah, you didn't hear what I said. You should have been groaning. Mm. Listen again. Let me ask you this. How careful was Christ about his character? How many sins did he commit? None. Why are you so slow to say none? How many sins did Christ commit? None. He lived on his earth three and a half years. Not one. He guarded his character. Now, Helen White says he took the same approach to his work as a carpenter. Ooh. Man. That 
is seriousness. You tell Christ, make me a chair. Back then, 2,000 years, he said, okay, cost you 50 pesos, whatever. <laughs> Get it back next Thursday. And Christ goes to work, cuts the wood, looks at it, because whatever your hand finds to do, how do you do it? And whether therefore you eat or drink, how should you do it? Uh -huh. Christ never forgot that. And he cuts the wood now for the chair, and he cuts it, and he lines it up, he starts to use the plane, he levels it, and he puts the back, then he puts the seat, he starts to sandpaper, he puts on the whatever the polish. When the person comes for the chair, he said, did you get this from the most holy place? <laughs> Where did this chair come from? Uh, this must be from the most holy place. I have never seen a chair so flawless. That is a responsibility you and I owe to God with the talents we have. That's why so many students flunk. They do not understand that academic work is a spiritual exercise. Because you're using the faculty that separates you from the animal kingdom. <laughs> the ability to reason and think and analyze and synthesize and conclude. This. Now, when you go back to your classes, Go back as a different person. What's your name? Yeah. Who? J.R. Yes, you're the man who knows all 66 books. There isn't a book called Lazy, Brother J.R. <laughs> of the 66. Now, you must stop being lazy today. You look like a nice fellow. You have a girlfriend? Get rid of her until you're hardworking. <laughs> she does not need a lazy man. All right, let the church say amen. She does not. She does not need a lazy man, JR. Let the woman go free and be happy. So she, she can find a hard working man. But JR, repent. Tell God, help me to work hard. She's also lazy. She is also lazy people in heaven. You go back to your classroom, a different person. You say, Father, I no longer need to compete to that guy with that fellow from England, UK. I no longer need to compete with that student from the United States. Huh? You gave me my mind, you gave me my talents, I will use them with the understanding I am accountable to you, not in comparison with Tom, Dick, or Harry. That's your attitude, because the spirit of competition will ruin you. It'll affect you mentally, put you on psychotropic medication. Because if you're competitive, there are two realities you cannot avoid. There will be some people brighter than you and some people dumber than you. What do you do? Those brighter than you will depress you. Those dumber than you will deceive you into thinking you're Einstein. And so you give up this spirit of competition and you say to God, Father, this is what I have. This is what I will use for your glory. Amen. And hard work glorifies God. Excellence glorifies God. And as you do your best with what you have, it is biblically guaranteed God will increase your supply of talents. Because God believes in uninterrupted growth. 2 Peter 3.18, growing grace never stops. Growth in grace never stops. It will continue into the new world. Growing, learning, developing the mind, I say again, into the new world. Since there's no death, can you imagine how much you will learn and still come short of what God knows? Do you realize that scientists do not know everything that goes on in one cell? Are you with me? Yeah. Or you take just a part of the cell, the mitochondrion, they don't understand everything that goes on in the mitochondrion. They do not fully understand photosynthesis. They can split the atom and blow up countries. They cannot understand a simple cell. All this we have to learn in the new world. 
God has given us a mind with the capacity to learn and learn and learn. But let me tell you, in the presence of a holy God, the foundation stone of your learning must be knowing God. Amen. Proverbs 1, 7, Proverbs 10, 9, 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom. Let God be the starting point of your journey, every stage in that journey, and the conclusion of that journey. And let your motivation be the glory of God. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, glorify God. Daniel, Mishael, Azariah. Joseph in Egypt, glorify God. We must do the same where we are. You are at this school to so conduct yourselves that God is seen in you. You can do that and be academically excellent at the same time. Amen. Are you following me? Amen. We don't trust God. And so we let him go to pursue excellence. Yet excellence originates with God. Do not think with the mind of the world. Think with the mind of God, which is the mind of light. The mind of the world is the mind of darkness. And so I leave you in the name of, in the presence of a holy God with these words. Do whatever you can with what God has given you. When David went off to fight Goliath, Saul said, use my armor. David tried it on, he took it off, he said, I can't use this. He went with this, whatever he had. And God used him mightily. Study within your capacity. Make sure you've done your best. When God made the earth, on day six, Genesis 1:31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. At the end of every day, you must look back before you fall asleep and begin to snore. You must say, and uh, JR saw everything he had done today, and behold, it was very good. Then you sleep with a clear conscience. <laughs> then tomorrow, same thing. Then Friday evening, when the day of rest comes in, like your creator, you look back over a week of creation. Hmm? And you say, and Pastor Paul saw everything he had done at AIS. And behold, in the evening or the morning, the sixth day. <laughs> what God did was very good. We're made in His image. We must function the same way. We can't do what He did. We can do what we can do by His enabling grace. Any questions? If you study gardening, and you get A's, whoever looks at your transcript will be impressed. An A grade impresses anyone regardless of what the subject is because it tells the person this person worked. So it's not so much the subject you study, it is how you study. The excellence. Press for the best. And God will honor that effort. Any questions? Is anyone romantically connected to a non-Adventist? Is anyone seeing a non-Adventist romantically? You don't want to raise your hand? I understand. Let me tell you in plain Tagalog. Break it off. <laughs> you see me smiling? Mm. No. no. <laughs> Listen to me. I speak now not as a preacher, as your older brother, older by two months maybe. <laughs> if you are romantically involved with a non-Seventh-day Adventist, break it off and stop dishonoring God. Adventist Home, page 67, paragraph 1. To connect with an unbeliever, is to place yourself on Satan's ground. 
Now, if you're already married, don't divorce. But if it's just boyfriend, girlfriend nonsense, stop it. Today. Call him. Don't go see him. Call him. If you go see him, he'll twist your head all the way around. You call him or take the pastor with you. And tell him, I have made a mistake on several levels. One, I dishonored my God. Two, I misled you into thinking my church supports this kind of behavior. It does not. A Seventh-day Adventist pastor has no authority to marry an Adventist and a non-Adventist. He can marry a Baptist and a Catholic. A Lutheran and a Mormon, they're the same thing. He cannot marry. Are you with me? Anyone in Babylon is Babylon. He cannot marry an Adventist and a non-Adventist. He can lose his credentials. Be not an equally yoked together with unbelievers. That includes business arrangements. Mm-hmm. Business arrangements, not with unbelievers. What is an unbeliever? Someone who does not believe present truth. Not someone who doesn't go to church. For the Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness is not a believer. For a Catholic, a Baptist is not a believer. For an Adventist, anyone who does not accept present truth is an unbeliever. One of the reasons why the wall cannot be finished in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah because the men married non-Adventist women. I said non-Adventist women. <laughs> Medical ministry, page 49, paragraph 4, Ellen White writes, Christ was a seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. <laughs> and nobody said amen. <laughs> <laughs> you are a tough crowd. Nobody says amen. <laughs> Medical ministry, page 49, paragraph 4, I think, 4 or 5. Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents. Everything he did, that's an SDA lifestyle. She didn't say he was a Baptist, even though he got baptized. His cousin was a Baptist, John the Baptist. <laughs> Not Jesus. Jesus is an SDA. Somebody say amen. Amen. Yes, he was. So if you're an Adventist, marry an Adventist. Are you with me? Atheist, marry an atheist. <laughs> if you eat meat, marry someone who eats meat. <laughs> but if you're an Adventist, finish my thoughts. Marry an Adventist. All right. Any questions? Yes, my good brother. But that's a big problem. They are worse than non Adventists. A hypocrite is worse than an unbeliever. We need to get right with God. We give the church a bad name. We give God a bad name when we don't live what we preach. You're very right. We need to repent. Either be right with God or leave God alone. Somebody else. Any married students? None of you married? God bless your family. It's not easy to be married and in school at the same time. But God will take care of you. Take care of him first. You know, Jesus gave us a formula for life. Seek ye first what? The kingdom. Yes. Most Christians don't trust that. They don't. But Christ said, here is the way. Seek the kingdom first. All these things shall be. You don't have to ask. Any other question? I'm going to pray for you. What prayer request do you have? None. No problems. No sins to be forgiven. No one needs tuition. No one has sick family members. No one has members who've left Christ. You are just perfect. I am in the wrong place. I feel so sinful in your presence. Are there no prayer requests? It's okay. I don't tend to blame. Okay, sister, yes. What's this thing? You have what? She has oh, cough. sorry. All right. But that's one prayer request. Okay. Um, for my roommates. Your roommates. How many do you have? Like ten. Ten in one room. <laughs> how big is that room? Like this church? <laughs> All right. Go ahead. What's the problem with your roommates? Um, uh, I want to pray for each one of 
Mm -hmm. Oh. And I have this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our is Okay. Are they here? Are they here? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. We pray for them. They can destroy the influence for the non Adventists. Yeah. That'll be a crime against God. Mm -hmm. It's a crime against God to so live your so called Christian life in a way that leads someone to hell. There's a prayer I began praying a few years ago Father, go to every man or woman over whom I've exerted a negative influence and reduce that influence so that person isn't lost because of me. I've been praying that prayer. You never know how you negatively, deliberately, or, or accidentally influence someone for hell and I ask God please if I've done that save that person because I can't go back and change the past all right your roommate something else uh -huh. Loving's roommate, okay, our friend, yes. Revival at the university, first in our lives, then on a broader scale. Revival must begin individually, must, and revival must come before reformation. And what brings revival? A return to the word. A uh, so return to the word, not singing loud music. Uh, you don't know that the Bible has ever been changed, shaved by special music. <laughs> Do you know no one in the Bible has ever been saved by music? Now, I have nothing against music, but sometimes we overemphasize music. We've come to choir practice, we won't come to Bible study. Everyone saved in the Bible was saved by the Word. Not special music, but God bless all music. But no one has been saved by special music. Yet, well, we love special music. We'll cut the sermon to have one more item. <laughs> huh? I don't understand what's wrong with this. We must stop drinking coffee. Okay. <laughs> Somebody else, what's your prayer request? No more? Okay. All right. Are you all healthy? Anyone sick? No one sick? You sick? She's sick. Well, you've decided she's sick. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 She said nothing, but that's your. All right, doctor. You have a cough? All right. Who else has a cough? Another. Yes, go ahead, sister. Yeah, because we have a group named Sense, and we're producing one million tracks. Uh-huh. So one, what kind of tracks? Musical tracks? <laughs> oh, you mean tracks to read? Yes. Okay, all right. Okay, I got you. All right. And uh, what's in the tracks? Um, it's about present truth. Present truth. Present truth. Do you know what present truth is? <laughs> you do? All right, sister. We pray for your tracks. Yes, brother, from um, the UK. Yes, well, actually, I live in Taiwan. Oh, that's fine. You're still from the UK. Yes. It's okay. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to ask that to my parents. Okay, okay. Taiwan's a Buddhist country. Oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. And you know, the Philippines, thank God, is the only Christian nation in this part of the world. Yes. So we thank God for the Philippines. I really mean that. Your parents in the okay. Are they Adventists? Yes, they Okay, are. okay. Yes. But in a society that does not value that kind of... Okay, yes. all right, okay. At times they can be more, the Buddhists can be more devout than the Adventists. And they can be violent too. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. much. Very, mm -hmm. very much. Hindus can be violent towards Christians. Too, too much. Yes. <laughs> there are Christians over the world who suffer terribly. We just don't know. They suffer, their lives at risk. Churches bulldozed. But we don't know. Yes. Uh, Pastor, if I have two prayer requests. The first one is for the literature evangelist. Okay. Uh, this coming May, they are expecting to have 1,000 students. Okay. Uh -huh. And the second one is for the graduate students. Some mm -hmm. of them, they are having hard time to accomplish all of the requirements. Okay. 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 Let, as you said, uh, graduates are having a difficult time. If God is your priority, your difficulties will shrink in size mm -hmm. or shrink in the amount of time needed to fix them. That is guaranteed if God is your priority. 
and I must hammer it home. <laughs> yes, my brother. study of the word of God. When you read the prayer of Jesus in John 17, that's the Lord's prayer. The focus of his prayer was that they might be one as we are one. That was the focus of his prayer. He wants the church to be one the way he and the Father is one, which means that the standards God has set for human beings are divine standards. Did you get what I just said? We're human beings, but we're required to live by divine standards. That's why we were made in God's image. Not the image of Gabriel. God. So the highest standard possible God has for us. Education, page 18, paragraph 3. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, God like this is the goal to be reached. It's amazing. God thinks so highly of you that his character is the standard he set for you. Oh boy. Mm. All right. May God bless that group of unity. The devil does not believe in unity. He likes to break up the brethren in fighting, split them. He doesn't care who's right or wrong as long as they're fighting and they've broken up. A uh, sad thing. Okay. Anyone else? Prayer request. Yes. Uh, can we pray for College of Medicine? College of Medicine. All right. Okay. Okay. So pray for what? Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, my good brother. Simple way to win souls. The literature work. Whether you're selling books, you give no tracks. Mm -hmm. It's non-intimidating. Very simple. And you attract. You don't need to be talented. <laughs> 1,000 student missionaries. Where are they? <coughs> okay, okay. All right. And also pour down 40 leaders. The what? 40 leaders. 40 leaders. And 1,000 students. Okay, okay. All right. Okay. Anything else? Yes? Pray for PYC. PYC. Yes. When is it coming up? June. June. Okay. All right. All right. I saw a hand back there. No. Oh yes. What's the question? Yes. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Not well. The, I don't know of any Bible verse that condemns it. Um, Abraham married Keturah. I don't think Keturah was Hebrew. He um, Moses had a non-Egyptian uh, wife, Zipporah. It is not the ethnicity of the person, it is the religion of the person. Amen. Are you with me? That's what's important. Now, I must also confess, there are certain unique challenges that come when you marry across culture. Yes, they are. You must be prepared to deal with them. I'm not denying that. But in the eyes of God, it is not the culture that matters, it is the religion that matters. 
But if a black man marries a white woman, he must be prepared for some white people and some black people who are narrow-minded. Are you following me? He must be prepared for that. If an Indian marries a uh, Pakistani, oh. he must be prepared for some trouble. <laughs> if a Japanese marries a Korean, they must be prepared for trouble. Mm. A Japanese or Filipino must be prepared for some challenges. But the fundamental basis of equality must be the religion. The religion. But if God gives you a bride outside of your ethnic group, marry her. Amen. You, God, and her first. The rest of the world second. But whether she's in your group or not, make sure God has put you together. All right. Anything else? Yes. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned earlier that um, God ma makes some people greater than mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. And you used the example of uh, Adam and Eve. Yes. Could you explain how Adam is greater than Eve? And what In the sense of authority. You see, Adam was made first, 1 Timothy chapter 2 indicating his priority over Eve with respect to leadership. That's what I mean by greater. Jesus says, my father is greater than I. In his humanity, in his divinity, the father had a greater position than Christ. Greater. Not more divine. By reason of office and responsibility, the father is greater. By reason of responsibility and office, Adam is greater. That's why when Eve sinned, the sin affected her. When Adam sinned, it affected the whole world. Because Adam was primarily in charge of the world. Ellen White said Adam was crowned king of heaven, king of Eden. She doesn't say Eve was crowned queen of Eden. Adam was crowned king. So he was great with regard to responsibility. When the crisis occurred, God came looking for Adam. I put you in charge first. What happened? If Adam had never sinned, the world would never have fallen into sin. All right, anyone else? Okay, the high priest was greater than the Levite. Not necessarily closer to God, but just greater responsibility. The Levite could not go into the most holy place, the high priest could, but only once a year. There are differences in greatness. And, you know, you read First uh, Chronicles 29, verse uh, 12, And in thine hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great, and to give strength unto all. God decides who will be great and who won't. He does. He said, the poor you have with you always. That was the way it was supposed to be before sin. Because God defines poor differently from the way we do. You know, poverty is a definition. When I was small, I was poor, but I didn't know. <laughs> Until some Western person told me I'm poor. I said, oh, okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> you never had a problem. All right. I need to pray now, let you go, let me go. I'm hot, sweaty, tired, and need to sleep. Anything else? Okay. Let's stand and pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this moment in your presence. We thank you, God, for listening to us, for the presence of your spirit, for the sweet attitude of your sons and daughters. For the interest in spiritual things, dear God, we thank you for this institution, Father, and its mission, its witness, its effect on this nation. We thank you for the leadership, dear God. If we've sinned against you, Father, forgive us, we pray. Forgive us on the basis of the sacrifice of Christ. Now, dear Father, I present to you, as a representative of this group, all the prayer requests that were mentioned, you heard them individually. You know the conditions in detail, dear God. We ask you, dear Father, to attend to every situation individually. As the good shepherd left the 99 sheep in the wilderness and went after that which was lost so that he met it one-on-one. -on -one. Meet us with our difficulties one-on-one. -on -one. Heal the sick, dear God. We have enough sickness in the world. Provide for those in need. Reclaim those who have backslidden from you, dear God. Break up mixed relationships, Father. Break them to smithereens. Bless the parents who labor so hard to keep their children in school. Bless the teachers. Bless the president, Father. Post 
untiring angels around this campus that those who come in and out may do so in safety. Father, with each passing day, let us seek to draw closer to the bosom of Jesus Christ, to look like him, to speak like him, to act like him, to think like him. Bless us in all that we do, dear God. Use us to lead others to you. And when you come into your kingdom, save us without losing one. We pray in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen. amen. And amen. God bless you. Thank you for your company and this sweet fellowship. And may the Lord bless you in all that you do.